Hello, welcome back to part two of misrepresentation. Okay, so last time we were talking about um, non-disclosure misrepresentation. We spoke about um, active concealment, and we also spoke about uh, half truth and partial disclosure. All right, so number three, right now I want to talk to you about a duty to, to impose where changing circumstances affect the truth of an earlier statement. The case of O'Flanagan is an example of where an, a changing circumstances affected the um, truth of an earlier statement. The ill doctor reduces practice income. Okay, The failure to disclose this is a form of misrepresentation. In an umberfied, umberfied uh, fidesz, utmost good faith, Okay, all party must make full disclosure of all facts with regards to the contract. This type of agreement usually arises in an insurance policy, family arrangement, and fiduciary duties. In these agreements, one party has privilege and knowledge over the other. It is required that both parties disclose all material facts. Failing to do so would render the agreement unenforceable. In Bank of BC versus Wren, um, the bank filed to disclose material facts about the status of the collateral pledge by the um, borrower. The uh, failure to disclose the material facts was held to be a misrepresentation of facts. Thus, the case was rescinded. In McGrath versus McLean, there is a duty to disclose the fact that the premises is unsafe to live in. A negotiation of a guarantee will impose a duty on the principal creditor to disclose all material facts. Page 334. Okay, so next part, part D. Non-disclosure and good faith. Traditional, under the traditional rule, parties negotiating agreement um, does not have have a duty to make full disclosure of material facts. American jurisprudence, however, will have a duty to disclose facts, and this duty is closely related to the duty to act in good faith. The statement of contract section, um, this restatement of contracts. Section 121B states that the uh, representer's failure to disclose material facts will constitute a misrepresentation. McCamus described this rule very clearly. Under this rule, where the information relates to a factual matter um, that, if disclosed, would cause the other party to refrain from entering the agreement, and where the non disclosure could not be justified on the grounds that the information. Uh, that the information party should be able to take advantage of their superior knowledge in the particular bargaining context. Page 335. If the information were disclosed, individuals might not have entered in the agreement. All right. So an example of a non-disclosure and good faith is when an employee is seeking a job security and the employer failed to disclose that the job is secured, uh, insecure. This non-disclosure will constitute a misrepresentation. Okay, in the case 978011, Ontario Limited, um, Cornell Engineering Company, it was held that a party to a contract owed no duty to bring termination um, clause of contract to the other party's attention before the contract was signed. McDonald was hired by um, Cornell pursuant to a service contract. McDonald draft the contract and signed uh, and was signed by Stevens, an agent of Cornell. Stevens signed the contract without reading it. In the termination clause, Cornell agrees to pay McDonald's two times the uh, numeration paid to date if the contract was terminated or changed. The trial judge held that McDonald's owed a duty of good faith to Cornell to bring the termination clause to their attention. However, in the Court of Appeal, McDonald had no duty to inform that Stevens about the uh, termination clause. The reason for this is the relationship between the two parties did not require McDonald um, to disclose such information to Stephen. If there were, uh, if there was any duty owed to Stephen, he discharged that duty when McDonald advised him to read the contract. Okay, so. If the note, um, important to note, Finn's five factor that would indicate 
situations where the duty to disclose would be imposed. Number one, past course of dealing between the parties in which the reliance, in which reliance for advice had, has been accepted, um, an accepted feature. Number two, explicit assumption by one party's um, party of advisory responsibility. Number three, uh, relevant possessions of the parties, particularly in their access to information and their understanding of possible demands of the dealing. Number four, um, manner in which the party were brought together and the exception that could create the relying party. And number five, whether true, whether truth and confidence knowingly has been um, reposed by one party to the other. Uh, page 336. Okay, part E. Recession and restitution. Okay, so if a party induces another into entering an agreement by misrepresentation, a remedy of recession will arise. Recession will unwind the contract and bring parties back to the original position before they entered into the contract. The restoration of benefits transferred to the other party under the agreement will be returned to its original owner. Below are main are the main types of recession and restitution. All right, number one, restoration of the status quo. Any party who enters um, a contract because of misrepresentation is able to seek remedy of rescission. Um, both parties will have the contract unwind and return to the position in which they were in before they entered into the contract, or restored to their pre-contract, um, pre-contractual pre uh, position. McCamus mentioned that in a in a purchase and sell contract. Um, a rescission would require the product to be returned to the seller and consideration be returned um, to be returned to the buyer. Okay, limitation or bans to recessionary relief. Relief will not be available if it is impossible to effect a mutual restoration of the benefit conferred by the parties. This is known as restoration of the status quo and it or restoration uh, restitution in integrum. The court of equity is much better equipped than the court of common law when dealing with resist, uh, recessionary relief. And that's because the court of uh, common law deals with monetary, uh, whereas the court of equity deals with recessions uh, such as this, right? Um, so, in a fraudulent misrepresentation case, the misrepresentee would be beneficial to choose to seek a decree of recession in equity. All right. So in Car and Universal Finance Company Limited and versus Cadwell, the seller of the car rescinded a sales agreement. There were there was no communication with the misrepresenter. The buyer purchased the car from the seller with a fraudulent check. When the seller had figured it out that it had he had been a victim of a fraud, the seller sold the car to someone else in good faith. However, the agreement was rescinded. Um, when the in seller informed the police and the automobiles association, the title of the car did not transfer to the third party. The misrepresentee was not um, communicated about the rescission of the sales agreement. In another situation, in other situation where there is no fraud, it would be required to issue a notice of el election to rescind. Um, in the restoration of the status quo, and it is impossible. Um, if a restoration of the status quo and is impossible, a decree of rescission will not be available under the traditional doctrine. However, if the benefit passes between parties, the benefit uh, can be returned to the original party. All right. So, if the restoration of the status quo is not possible, where there is no rescission, it would be difficult to return perishable goods. The court of equity cannot restore both parties to their pre-contract uh, condition state uh, because Oh well, but they should be given relief where possible. All right. So um, that's the end right now for um, this section here. I will talk more about this um, section later on. All right. Um, so until next time, resistance and restitution. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, part E. Thank you for listening. Bye.